This conference will now be recorded. very close to my face. Seems like we're a little slow in people logging in, so we'll give it a minute and then we'll get started. All right. Um, looks like we have a good, good portion of people here, and it's noon, so we should get started. So, um, welcome everyone to our virtual event, "The Computer's Voice" from Star Trek to Siri. I'm Michelle Pings Gaines from the Office of Alumni Relations, and I'd like to take this time to thank everyone who made a gift to Manhattanville during the registration for today's event. Your gift during these times is greatly appreciated by everyone at the college. I have a few announcements before we, be, we begin. Um, everyone has been muted by the event organizers. Please be mindful if you called in on the phone that we are unable to mute you and you, we will hear everything that your receiver picks up. So please mute yourself. If you have any trouble throughout the event or have questions, please use the chat function in the top right of your screen. There should be a little speech bubble there. Um, this, is, this event will be recorded and housed in the virtual event recordings library at alumni.mbil.edu slash recording. Um, I think those are the, all the housekeeping items that I have, so I would like to introduce our presenter for this event, lecturer in academic writing, Liz Baker. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to have this talk. Um, I owe this all to Michelle, who organized all of this, so thank you. Um, so I am, uh, like Michelle said, I'm a lecturer in academic writing at Manhattanville. I have been teaching here for about six years now, um, and I have a book coming out in December. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, I will just give you a little heads up. The audio in uh, GoToWebinar is a little wonky. So when I show video clips, and I'm going to show four of them, I have to exit out of the PowerPoint, change my audio settings, go back in, show you the video, exit out, change my audio settings, go back in. So it'll take a minute. Bear with me. <laughs> um, ironically, in this presentation about voices, my voice is going to be a little weird so bear with me um if at any point you can't hear me but you see me trying to talk just somebody shout at me all right so let's dive right into it i'm going to share my powerpoint with you okay all 
All right, also, I can't see the chat um, or any of your faces in this, so um, we'll do some Q&A afterwards. So, like I said, I am Liz Fieber. My contact information is here. Um, there will be time for Q&A, but if you have any other questions or concerns or freakouts, for those of you who've been my students in the past, you know that's always a relevant question. Um, you are welcome to email me at any time. Um, my website is also on here. Uh, that has a link to order the book if you're interested in it. Um, and you can also check out all my other research on there. So first order of business, um, let me set a timer real quick. Siri, please set a timer for 45 minutes. Your timer is set for 45 minutes. Thank you. Okay, so talking computers are literally everywhere. We have Alexa, we have Google, we have Siri. They all help with all these everyday tasks, setting timers, finding new directions, changing the radio station, all kinds of things. And it's all simple voice interactivity. You talk at a phone or at a, um, a little echo, whatever's set up in your house, and it does what you've asked of it. So my first big question when I started this project was where did they come from and how did we get so comfortable with them all of a sudden? Well, so to set the stage for you a little bit, we have to talk about IBM's Watson. Now, back in February of 2011, um, Watson went on Jeopardy and beat Jeopardy champions Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. Now, Watson is a lot like Siri or Alexa. He is um, a voice interactive software, essentially. Um, we usually describe him as artificial intelligence, but it's a little more complicated than that, which I'll get into in a second. But this was really the first public demonstration of voice interactive computing. And then we get to Siri, a lady in your pocket. So Siri was released in October of 2011 on iPhone 4S as a personal assistant app. So less than a decade ago. In the original release, there were five language settings. Um, the female voices were American English, Australian English, and German. And then there were two male voices, British English or French. So back in 2011, when this first came out, I was one of the first people to buy an iPhone 4S. I was so excited to have a, a talking computer. Um, but my first thought as an American media scholar was, why is Siri female? Why does the US want me to have a lady secretary in my pocket. That seems bizarre. So that was the genesis of this project. Now, importantly, as it turns out, both IBM Watson and Siri were actually inspired by science fiction computers, which as a Trekkie was very exciting for me to find out. Watson, according to the creator of the software, um, was inspired by HAL 9000 in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Both those computers were gendered male. And the enterprise computer in Star Trek inspired Siri. Both were gendered female, at least in the US. And the next big question is, how does AI actually work? Well, in science fiction, things like HAL 9000, have real sentience. They can feel and think and are self-aware. Real computers are not sentient. Don't panic. Siri is not actually watching you do anything or listening to you. However, we do have what's called smart technology. We hear this all the time. We talk about smartphones or smart speakers or smart homes. So a smart device uses data to anticipate the needs of its user. You can see here an ad for Sonos smart speakers from 2017. So the way that those work and the way that things like Amazon Echo work is that you talk to it, you ask it to do things, it listens. Um, Liz, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. Sorry. Sorry. There was a okay. comment in the chat that we can't see your whole screen. Um, oh. I don't know if, because we didn't have that problem when we, were, when we were testing it. I don't know if perhaps it's on one of your monitors, monitors partially or something? Hmm, no, I have it up fully. 
that works. That looks good. Okay. Weird. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so anyway, so smart speakers, um, they listen to what you have to say, keep all of that data about what you've asked for, and then use algorithms to anticipate what you might ask for next time. So all those times when you are having a conversation about how much you want a hammock in your backyard, and then all of a sudden you start seeing ads for that on Facebook, that's how smart data works. That's how algorithms work. But do we have the capacity to build truly intelligent computers? Yes and no. That depends on your definition of intelligence. So we don't really have a consensus on what it means to actually be intelligent. We can go back to Descartes and talk about, I think, therefore I am. But even that doesn't quite get at what we're talking about. So in 1950, this really famous computer scientist named Alan Turing came up with what we call today the Turing test. So this is when a human is talking to a computer either through text or through image, or image through voice, um, and can't tell the difference between a computer and a human. The human talking to the computer is tricked into thinking that they're talking to an actual human. In 1950, when Alan Turing came up with that, there were no computers that could pass the Turing test. That was a dream, a, a, a desire for a future computing system. Today, most of our computers can pass the Turing test. Siri is actually capable of passing the Turing test. Um, so it's, it's more commonplace today. Now, the key thing is understanding the difference between intelligence and seeming to be intelligent. So back in the 1960s, there is a guy named Donald Fink, who is an engineer, um, and he wrote an entire book on artificial intelligence. And one of his key points was that a phonograph sounds like a person. It sounds like there's a person speaking in the room with you when you listen to a phonograph, but it's not actually an intelligent person there. You're just hearing an audio recording. Same thing today with something like an MP3. Now, Joseph Weizenbaum is another computer engineer in the 1960s, and he invented a computer called ELISA. Now, ELISA was a therapy computer. Um, essentially, um, a person would sit down at the console. There was no voice. It was all text-based. And ELISA would say, how are you feeling today? And the person would say, but, you know, I'm really upset that I don't have a hammock in my backyard. And Eliza would say, why are you upset that you don't have a hammock in your backyard? And the conversation would continue. Now, the thing is, Eliza wasn't actually responding to what the person had to say. The software was taking a statement and turning it into a question. I am upset about this thing. Why are you upset about this thing? Which is an actual therapeutic technique. Um, it's called Rogerian therapy. Um, and it worked. That's the bonkers thing, is that people knew that this was a computer, but as they started typing, they forgot that they were talking to a computer. They forgot that Joseph Weizenbaum and his team of engineers were off in another room reading everything they were writing to Eliza. And when they found out, they were so mad because they had just had what they thought was a real secure private therapy session with a computer. And Joseph Weizenbaum was just horrified by this. But what we learned is that it's actually pretty easy for a computer to pass the Turing test as long as it seems intelligent to the human user. Now there's one final important term that we talk about when we talk about human computer interactions and that's anthropomorphism. This is when we treat inanimate objects or animals as humans. So in human computer interactions research or HCI research, um, researchers have found that people use human-like cues, things like a voice or language writing to mindlessly anthropomorphize computers. So we don't actually have to think about whether Siri is real or fake, we just talk. That's our natural instinct as humans, is to talk. And so we unconsciously treat our objects like people. Siri is a representation of human intelligence. 
whether or not she's actually intelligent is entirely beside the point. So here you can see my absolute favorite uh, painting, The Treachery of Images by Rene Magritte. And here in French, these words mean, this is not a pipe, because this isn't a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. It's a representation of it. The same way that Siri is a representation of intelligence. So here's an actual conversation that I had with her. I said, Siri, are you a person? And she said, I'm a virtual assistant, not an actual person, but you can still talk to me, which is so indicative of seeming to be intelligent. That is exactly how Siri functions. Now, to bring us back around to science fiction, I know I'm about to show you a clip that's not science fiction, but I want to talk about how media representation is created. So when we talk about film or television, there are two important things happening. There's sound recording, which separates the voice from the body and becomes a representation of sound. So we're recording this message, this talk right now. At some point in the future, someone can listen to me, even though I'm not standing in front of them talking. They're hearing my voice separated from my body. It's a representation of the sound. Same thing with video recording. It separates the image from the body. So we can watch movies of people who are no longer alive, but they seem to be alive in front of us on the screen. Same thing at some point in the future, someone can watch this video and they will see me in front of them, even though I'm not literally in front of them. Now, when we put those two things together, we get what's called synchronized sound. Typically, sound and image are projected together to match. This creates what Michelle Shion calls the illusion of presence. It feels like someone is present. This is happening live right now. I am not currently sitting in your room or your living room or wherever. I am being projected. My sound and image are being projected through the internet to you. It's the illusion of presence. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a clip from Singing in the Rain that'll demonstrate this. When I talk about it in theory, it sounds a little wonky. Um, but there's this great movie, Singing in the Rain. If you've never seen it, that's first order of business as soon as this webinar is over. It is delightful. Um, the whole plot of the movie is that um, a sound film has come to fruition. And so what happens when a silent film star sounds terrible? So there's the star, Lena Lamont, and she has the worst voice ever. But she's really powerful, and so they're not going to fire her. So what the studio decides to do is to secretly get another woman, Kathy Selden, played by Debbie Reynolds, you dub in her voice. Okay, now I'm going to show you a clip that demonstrates how audio recording and video recording are projected together to create the illusion of presence. Now, hold on, I gotta switch my sound. her charms would you would you they met as you and I and they were only friends but before the story ends he'll kiss her with a sigh
Liz, we can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So, what I was saying was that what we saw was the recording of someone's voice and the projection of it onto their body. Um, I am currently finding it hilarious, the, the tension between my voice and my image. So this is actually working out really well. <laughs> um, so that's how media representation is created. We take sound, we take image, we project them together. So what happens when we have voices without bodies? This is what's called the acousmator. Um, this is a term that Pierre Schaeffer coined. Um, it means a sound that one hears without seeing what causes it. Right. And this applies outside of media. Um, that's just sort of a general term. You hear a sound, but you don't see where it originated from. Now, in media, we have what's called the acousmatic character. This is a character who is of the acousmator. They're neither inside nor outside the image. They're not speaking from somewhere off screen, having a conversation with a character on screen. They're just not seen. We don't know what their body looks like and we don't know where their voice is coming from. Now this includes voiceover narration or a disembodied character. The classic example is The Wizard of Oz from The Wizard of Oz. Um, we see this big floating head and a booming voice, but we don't know where it's coming from. We don't see the origins. And this creates dramatic tension. The wizard is terrifying until we pull back the curtain and see the man behind it. Right? So as soon as the voice is located within a body, the dramatic tension is released. Now, what about when there is a computer body? This is a term that I coined called the acousmatic computer. This is when we have a disembodied human voice, an actor, and we project it onto a computer body to create the illusion of a sentient computer. Now, the example I'm gonna show you here is from 2001, A Space Odyssey. This is the famous open the pod bay doors hal scene. Um, the first few seconds are silent, so hang in there if you don't immediately hear things. Open the pod bay doors, please. Do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dan. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, although you took very thorough precautions in the park against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. Okay. So what we saw in that scene was two characters talking to one another. 
One was a human, that's Dave. And you could see his lips move and you could hear his voice as though he were present speaking. And then we saw Hal's glowing red eye and a voice along with it. Now cutting back and forth between Dave and Hal creates the illusion that they're having a conversation. Hal 9000 isn't real. He's just a prop on set. He, it is just a prop on set. But projecting a voice onto it, creating an acousmatic computer is what creates the illusion that he is a character, a person in this film with sentience. So what does gender have to do with any of this? So to answer that, we need to do a couple of quick definitions. So sex is a label we use based on the identification of body parts and genetics. The three major terms we use in the West are male, female, intersex. Gender is the expression of identity. And this is dependent on things like your pronouns, your clothing, your behavior, your interactions with others. These are cultural expressions. And then we have sexual orientation, which is different from sex and gender. This is feeling romantically and or sexually attracted to people with particular gender identities. So that includes straight, gay or lesbian, bisexual, asexual, etc. Okay, all three of these terms are labels that we use. They're terms we've invented to describe bodily existence. Now, in science fiction, humanoid robots or androids, these are robots that are shaped like people, they're often given sex and gender characteristics, sometimes also sexual orientation. It depends on the narrative. Um, but the key aspects are sex and gender. And this allows us as an audience to build empathy with them. So one big example here is Pris from Blade Runner. She is a female android, that's her sex. We know because we actually see her do a nude scene at one point in the film. Um, so that is a visual verification of what we would call sex. Um, and then she also presents as a woman, right? that's her gender. You can see she's wearing clothes that we would code as for women and a haircut that we would code as for women. So what about computers that don't have human bodies, non-humanoid computers, or those acousmatic computers? Well, what I found in my research is that the gender of the actor is also projected onto the computer body through their voice. So one aspect of gender is the voice. Right? We associate a certain pitch and a certain way of speaking with a particular gender. So for example, Douglas Rain, that's him here, he um, was man and he his gendered voice was projected onto HAL 9000's computer body. Right? So we also read gender into HAL. Now there are obviously other ways that it's done. It's in the interactions between characters, it's in the pronouns that they use, things like that. Quick pause just to make a note about race um, to contextualize the text that I've been talking about and that I write about in the book. Um, all of the acousmatic computers in film and television, at least in American film and television, that's my area of focus, between 1966 and 2013 were voiced by white actors. Now this is really important because these are specifically white narratives that erase black, indigenous, and people of color from conversations about gender and technology. And I go into more detail about that in the book. I just wanted to make a quick note here and point out that there are a couple of excellent books that talk specifically about race and artificial intelligence. Um, my primary focus is on gender, but I do recognize the connections between gender and race throughout the book where possible. So. Why can't we just take all the identity out of the equation? Why do we have to talk about gender or race or any of that stuff? Well, let's take war games, for example. So the computer Joshua in war games 
doesn't have a gendered voice. It's fully synthesized, which means it's computer generated. There was no actor giving voice to the character. And yet it's gendered in the film through its name. Its name is Joshua. It's named after a character in the film, the son of its creator. And even though you can see Matthew Broderick here, very young Matthew Broderick, um, he is the, the young programmer who sort of hacks into this computer. If you haven't seen War Games, that's second order of business after this talk is watch Singing in the Rain and then watch War Games. Um, at first, the character is called Joshua It. Later on, as the characters build empathy and build a relationship with the computer, he starts calling him he. He does this. He feels this. So even without a gendered voice, the computers are still gendered. We're sort of naturally programmed to do that through culture is we build connections and we build identity with each other through our voices, through talking, through our interactions with people. So throughout representations of acousmatic computers, we have what I call gendered narratives. This is when acousmatic computers are placed into established cultural narratives of gender and relationships. So Siri, I call her a lady in my pocket, but she's also called a personal assistant app. We know what a personal assistant is. We have an image in our heads of what that person probably looks like, what gender they have, how they dress, how they talk. This is true in science fiction as well. Acousmatic computers are situated, they're, they're characters in stories that have assumptions about gender. So the very first appearance of a talking computer was in Star Trek, the original series. There's this episode called Mud's Women from October of 1966. Now, this episode is a dumpster fire of sexism. Um, the whole plot is that there's this guy, Harry Mudd, who has these three women. Um, he's selling them into slavery to be wives on some planet full of miners, um, like people digging in mines, not young people. Um, so the scene I'm going to show you here, the computer is recording an interrogation of Harry Mudd um, by Captain Kirk, and you'll see um, Spock in here as well. Surely you're not going to take the word of a soulless mechanical device over that of a real flesh and blood man. State your correct name for the record. Harry Mudd. Incorrect. Arthur Fenton Mudd. Any past offenses, Mr. Mudd? Of course not. Gentlemen, I'm simply in trouble. Um, Incorrect. read our minds too. Can, darling, they can. Just what's on the record. Offense record, smuggling, sentence, suspended, transport of stolen goods, purchase of space vessel with counterfeit currency, sentences, psychiatric treatment, effectiveness disputed. Mr. Okay, so what we saw in that clip is amazingly exactly how Siri works. They ask Harry Mudd a bunch of questions and the computer can tell if he's lying based on whether what he says matches up with what's on the record. Siri could do this too. You could ask me what my name is and if I say my name is Harry Mudd, Siri would be able to say, no, it's not, not according to your DMV records. You also notice at the end of that clip that one of the women says it can read our mind. And we have that sensation about our computers as well, right? 
remember the example, I say to my friend, I would like a hammock for my backyard. And you know what? As I'm doing this talk, I bet you I'm going to have an ad on Facebook later today for hammocks for my backyard. It feels like our computers are reading our minds, but in fact, what they're doing is collecting data and comparing it to the record. So from a narrative standpoint, what the Star Trek computer is doing is acting like a secretary. It's an assistant, and it sounds like it as well. It sounds very cold and impersonal. And to talk to it, you push a button and it talks to you in this kind of mechanical voice, almost like an executive who pushes a button at their desk and talks to a secretary out in the reception area. Right? That's what it was modeled after. Now, what happens if the relationship changes? So I'm going to show you a clip from an episode, also from season one, but from 1966, uh, 1967, where the computer is reprogrammed to have more personality. Um, and I'll let you see what that sounds like. Um, again, this episode is a dumpster fire of sexism. We'll talk about that in a second. That's a really key aspect of this episode. Computer on. Record. Recording. Dom? Captain's log supplemental. Engineering officer Scott informs Wolf engines damaged, but can be made operational and re-energized. Computed and recorded, dear. Computer, you will not address me in that manner. Compute. Computed, dear. Mr. Spock, I ordered this computer and its interlinking systems repaired. I have investigated it, Captain. To correct the fault will require an overhaul of the entire computer system. A minimum of three weeks at a star base. I wouldn't mind so much if only it didn't get so affectionate. It also has an unfortunate tendency to giggle. <laughs> I take it that a lady computer is not routine. We put it in the Signet 14 for general repair and maintenance. Signet 14 is a planet dominated by women. I seem to feel that the ship's computer system lacked a personality. I gave it one. Female, of course. <laughs> Well, you, you people certainly have interesting problems. I'd uh, I'd love to stay around to see how your girlfriend works out, but I'm afraid you'll have to. All right, that's the last clip I promise. Um, but what you can see in this clip is a couple of different things. So one, the episode, it, the scene is about the acousmatic computer, but it's really about Kirk and Captain Kirk's relationships. So Kirk is well known as a ladies man in the episode, even by just this episode later on in the first season. He will sleep with anyone who shows up and that's just part of his character. Remember this is the late 60s, it was the time of free love, right? Exploring human sexuality was okay in this time period and we hadn't quite gotten to the height of second wave feminism. So thinking about women's roles and the liberation of women hadn't quite happened on the national stage yet. So that's not reflected in this narrative. But when the computer is given more personality by a race of women, that is threatening to him as the kind of alpha male of the ship, as someone who is a ladies man. So then for a computer to be pursuing him feels inappropriate. Now, from today's perspective, we read this narrative in a slightly different way. We see the sexism of Spock being annoyed at a female computer having personality. We see how uncomfortable it makes the men in the situation to suddenly have um, a, a female voice being aggressively sexual. And 
we see workplace sexual harassment, which wasn't a term in the 1960s. But if you saw this in your office, you would intervene and go to HR immediately. So that brings me to my next point, which is that gender narratives shift over time and gender roles shift over time. And that's the heart of the book, is that the way that we understand gender is radically different depending on the time period. So what do we learn from this whole idea of the acousmatic computer and the way that gender is projected through voice? Well, first of all, body parts don't determine gender. You know, we think of Siri as a lady in your pocket, even though she doesn't have all the body parts that we would generally associate with women. So this is really key in gender studies is understanding that sex and gender are cultural constructs. That's one aspect. The other aspect, like I said, gender norms change over time. In the book, I go more or less decade by decade to examine how representations of acousmatic computers shift depending on how we feel about computers. So in the 1970s, they're all really scary because they weren't ubiquitous. Computers were mostly associated with the government and with war. And so that's what those texts are about. By the time we get to the 1990s and early 2000s, computers were becoming ubiquitous. They were entering the home exactly at the same time that more and more women were going out into the workforce. So all of those texts are about how computers displace women's traditional roles in the family. And there's a bunch of stuff in between as well. <laughs> um, I don't have time to go through the whole book, but I you know, recommend it. Some other things we learned. Um, we act out gendered relationships, even with non-humans. So this goes back to the idea that body parts don't determine gender. We perform gender every day unconsciously, and we do it in between our reactions. Right? We interact with other people, even you know non-people, and we are constantly performing gender through it. Now, the final really important thing that we learned from this is that media and software development industries are both still male dominated. And that is really important when we talk about computer development. So every acousmatic character in American sci-fi film and television between 1966 and 2013 was created by a man. Now, interestingly, that episode I showed you yesterday, is, uh, tomorrow is yesterday, with sexy computer voice that was actually written by a woman the computer itself had been created as a character prior to that but it's interesting the ways that we get to see different interactions between a gendered character and a human character based on who's creating it so we know that the more diversity we have in production the more diversity we have in representation and that's a huge thing we learned from this the other side of it, though, is that we know that software engineers are inspired by science fiction. A 2019 UNESCO study showed that consumer technologies generated by male-dominated companies often reflect troubling gender biases. So just like in representation and in media production, the more homogenous your production team is, the more homogenous your representations are. The more homogenous your computer technology and design team is, the more troubling the representations are. So the takeaway is we need greater representation. We need to think more about how gender is represented in film and television and in our actual computer um, programs. So what can we do? First of all, pay attention. That's the biggest thing. You have to start noticing how gendered narratives are structured and seek out texts that play with those ideas. Um, I don't have time really to talk about the Bechdel test here, but I recommend researching that and looking up texts that pass what's called the Bechdel test. Um, the more money you spend on texts by women, 
by people of color, by black artists, the more companies see that that's what we want and they'll respond and start paying those artists to do their work. We can re reconsider how we use gendered language. Um, I've started using y'all instead of you guys. That's a small one, but key because not everybody is a guy. And the language that we use is really important and can have a really big impact. We can support organizations for women and LGBTQ plus people in STEM. That is huge. You can donate to them. You can um, go to team competitions. If There are lots of robotics competitions. If they have those in your area, go and support those teams. Um, and we can read and watch media created by women and LGBTQ plus people. So that is my whole talk. I managed to come in just about under five minutes left. Um, just a quick reminder, you can pre-order the book now from University of Minnesota Press. The link is on my website um, and it'll be out in December. So let me come back over here. So what questions or concerns or freakouts do y'all have? Is there a raise hand function or do we just I, talk? I arrived, I arrived late because I'm in a different time zone and I didn't realize it. Um, I can, if this is being recorded. How can I um, watch it again or start at the beginning, I guess? So um, we are going to try and post this by the end of the week. So it'll be at alumni.mbill.edu slash recording. I'll put that in the chat. Oh, hold on, you were a lot faster than I am. I wasn't prepared for the information. Go ahead. Alumni.mbill.edu slash recording. And do I get to choose? There'll be different recordings, correct? Yes. Uh, we've been recording all of our events, so you'll just go right. to the I, event. I, I, want, I was in like one watch. last week. I was in one last week. I just didn't um, I didn't need to listen to it because I was there the whole time. Okay. Um, I heard what you said at the end, and, and perhaps I'm out of line, and I can live with that, and maybe you covered it, and I can live with that. Um, I... Uh, I was a child of the 70s, 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. and we worked very hard to break barriers. I mean, I was a woman in banking when all the, the only person you could be in banking was a secretary. Right um, on. So we fought the good fight. I just, I, I, I personally, I, I guess because I've done it and I'm comfortable in my skin that I don't worry so much about using the right or wrong pronouns and what have you. Mm -hmm. I try to hear the people I'm talking to and figure it out. Um, and I, I don't care about gender. It's there. And, you know, if, if, if it's an important to you, I try to live with it. But um, as I said, I came in late, so maybe I missed some of this. Um, I don't, I mean, and again, feel free to chastise me if you will, but... <laughs> But um, if I don't seek out something by a man versus a woman, or a woman versus a man, I, I guess at my stage of the game, I don't, I'm not too worried about it. Mm -hmm. I have seen such milestones in my lifetime. If you were around then, you would, you know, I, I don't worry about it quite as much as younger people do because we have made great strides, uh, and I hope. I mean, I'm, I'm for everybody being, you know, treated equally. But that's why I want to go back and listen to the rest of it to see if I missed something. Um, as I said, I am not such a techie that I have to worry about who made that piece of tech for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, if I miss something big or if I made a big misstep, please tell me. No, I think you bring up a really good point. Um, essentially... It, we have come a long way. We have really come a long way. However, um, the gender pay gap still exists. We still have a default female computer assistant, which 
according to that UNESCO 2019 study, reinforces the notion that a woman a woman's job is to be an assistant. Right now we are breaking those barriers. To be a what? I'm so sorry, I didn't hear. To be a a woman's job is to be a. Sure. The existence of um, gendered software and the fact that Siri's default female in the U.S. reinforces gender stereotypes that women like you have been working so hard to to break free from. And so there have been a whole bunch of studies that show that um, even software reinforces. Now, I'll give you an example outside of the US. So in Germany, when um, GPS, voice interactive GPS systems were first introduced in the late 90s and early 2000s, the default voice was female. And there were not an insignificant number of men who returned the device and said, I don't trust it. directions from a woman. <laughs> I need you to reprogram this. Okay. Well, and the company okay. actually listened. They said, okay, we won't use a woman's voice, which means that the woman who does the voice acting no longer has a job. It means that we're reinforcing that stereotype. And it means that we're just letting it go. Right. So these are small things. I will fully admit that okay. we probably have bigger problems. But right. the idea is the more we pay attention and the more we put our money where we want it to go, the closer we get to an equal society. Right. Well, maybe I feel maybe I feel like I'm fairly equal in my world. How's that? Um, first, first things first, uh, when I when I retired some time ago, um, I was a vice president at, at a bank as, at a major national bank. So I felt that I had and I made very good money. So I, I guess I was, you know, I, I'm not too worried about that. And when we got our first portable GPS that we put into our car, because they weren't built in back in those ancient times, um, it came with multiple voices. So it must have been after that had happened. But my, my late husband and I figured out that we actually, we chose from many different voices, accents, Southern, Australian, and we, were, and we ended up picking one and we gave her our own name because we didn't like the name they gave her. So, you mm -hmm. know, um, I guess I felt that it, we, we, we were, oh, well, my husband didn't have problem taking directions from a, whim, a woman, uh, but he good. was a good guy. That speaks <laughs> highly of you and your right. husband. Right, and right, right. those are wonderful stories, and that's where we want people to be. The fact is we're not there yet, and so it's up to all of us to really keep fighting and keep pushing to make sure that every woman has that opportunity. Right. And, and I am only I am a mother of all sons, by the way, and I think, <laughs> and I think that they have been raised um, with a good, healthy respect for the importance of women. Um, Wonderful. My oldest, who's the only one who's married at this point, the others have, are not, old, oddly enough, they're not old enough to be married, even though they should be because I'm an old person. But my son married a woman who is brilliant and witty and, and I think he wouldn't have settled for less. And they are absolutely equals. And I, I guess I feel I've done my job. And the other two are still, I have twins who are 23 and still in, and still in grad school. So um, I That's think they wonderful. Too, Yeah, I think they too we have, have been some other questions brought up I would like them to be. Pardon? I, I, we have, we have some other questions in the chat and I want to make sure oh, other sorry. people get a chance. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. But I was just... Um, th those of us who were at Manhattanville, when the Sacred Heart nuns were running the place, there was, I was never, there. I was there a, then. Yes, but there was never a question of what women's roles in the world were. I mean, they ran Manhattanville, and you never questioned that women were capable of running things and of doing whatever mattered. And they encouraged it in every way. I mean, I, when my father passed and, and I went into the printing business and run, running my family's uh, printing factory. And, you know, my, the thing is, you know, not only was I his, you know, not my father, I was his daughter. And basically my feeling was, you know, 
your choice, either stay or leave. You know, I'm going to succeed without you or with you. So make up your mind. And nobody left. And may no. I, and, may I ask, and when did you graduate? What? When did you graduate? 1963. Okay, so you're a little, a little older than I am. Um, yes. Uh, good on you, by the way. You know, well, I, but I, I, I attribute a lot of it to having been educated by Sacred Heart nuns. Right. However, when I was there, we were that generation that caused a lot of trouble. When we arrived, the nuns were wearing um, their habits with those very closed faces. You know, the, the, you know what I mean. I don't know what they're called. Those things that surrounded their faces so tightly. And the, by the year we graduated, the nuns were wearing T-shirts, jeans, and sandals, which also showed that they were taken over too, as far as I'm concerned. I think they did a great job, and I agree. I agree with you. They did a great job. Okay, we do have several questions in the chat, so I would like to give everyone a chance to talk or ask their question. I think the first one, um, Liz, is someone would like you to put your link for the for your website in the chat, and I think that would be really helpful. The next one is um, Matt Connolly has a question. Um, so if you want to unmute yourself, Matt, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so, Matt. so um, I just... Um, no, because I, um, I know you were talking a lot about Eliza, and um, I remember, um, like, it, it never really occurred to me how, um, like, what Eliza was, because I know whenever, several years ago, if you, I think if you asked Siri, um, she would always talk about Eliza, and Eliza, and Eliza, and it <laughs> never made any sense, and I actually Googled it, um, I just never... I never, never occurred to me, but, um, but yeah, no, so thank you for clarifying, but um, also, um, with like, um, so, so I guess having like a sort of a pluralistic, I think it's the view of like, um, people is kind of like what the goal is, right? Like kind of acknowledging differences, but not making kind of like not making any one, obviously not making anyone like, um, superior to another, but like how the so like um how would like how would what would be like almost like a step for someone to take um in terms of like what you do um in terms of like your study sure um so in terms of like recognizing and appreciating gender difference is that what you're asking um in the context of yeah like um film and like um and yeah like and when in the entertainment industry and like in that sense in general because i would say i'm yeah. a, definitely a pretty I, I mean i try my best to be an accepting person um of all differences and um and appreciate other people but yeah i guess just in your like field <laughs> absolutely so in terms of the entertainment industry um some of the biggest things are, are what i was talking about at the end is so for example something like the show transparent right that was a widely popular show. It was hugely groundbreaking in showing transgender characters, but the transgender character was played by a cisgender man, right? And he stepped back from it and said, I'm not going to do this show anymore because I would like for transgender actors to actually be getting work. And so supporting that decision vocally is a big thing and um, seeking out TV shows or movies that feature not just characters of a variety of genders, but also actors of a variety and, and race and class and able-bodiedness, right? Look for diversity in your media. That's huge because it, it really is true. If we stop buying things, producers will stop making them. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I guess just how to, um, like you said, kind of um, um, like we're not there yet, how to go there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think the goal is not to get rid of gendered narratives. The goal is to help us have more diverse narratives about gender. Yeah. So thank it you. looks like um, Maria has a couple questions. 
Maria, do you want to ask your questions? I can ask them. Um, so how much do you think gendering of fictional computers has changed in the last couple of years is the first question. And the second question is how much has changed as these computers have been given more humanity? Mm. Um, a lot has changed in the last few years. Um, although interestingly, so the last film that I talk about in the book is Her, Spike Jones's film from 19, uh, 19, 2013. Um, and it incorporates a lot of the same tropes as the earlier films, um, but plays with it in an interesting way. Um, so I think it's changed a lot because culture has changed a lot since the 1970s and the mid 1960s. Um, particularly in the last few years since 2013, we really haven't seen any major um, media examples of acousmatic computers in large part because we have them. So science fiction is sort of focusing on other issues now, um, which I think is a big sign in how far we've come. Um, I think the more that they become pervasive and ubiquitous, the more we are ascribing some sense of humanity, um, but it's complicated, right? Because they're also associated with corporations. And so I know Apple is listening to me. I don't think about the person listening to me. I think about what the company is doing with my data. So at the same time that we are humanizing our smart speakers and our smart homes, and you know, we talk to Alexa all the time, we're also dehumanizing it because we're more aware of what exactly is going on behind the smart speaker. Okay, it looks like we have one last question um, from Vanessa. She wanted to know um, what brought you into this research and that it's fascinating. Mm. So I got into Star Trek when I was an undergrad. Um, like real into Star Trek, super into Star Trek. Um, and then when I started my PhD, I originally thought that I was gonna write about um, movies about ghosts and the afterlife. And then I was like, we, I like Star Trek. And then Siri came out in 2011. Um, I was in the second year of my PhD when Siri came out um, and everything just kind of like clicked together. So this became my doctoral dissertation. Um, and then more recently, folks like you, Vanessa, and Mike, and all my colleagues at Manhattanville really put the peer pressure on me to be writing and to work on it. And so it developed out into a full book now. So that was the journey. All right. If anybody else has a question, feel free to um throw it in the chat otherwise i'd say we're just about at one o'clock um it looks like the last one is did you start with star trek the tv series william shatner etc so i grew up on next gen my mom is also a trekkie um but i sort of didn't like sci-fi for a long time and then yeah when i was an undergrad i um star trek the original series was would play at like two o'clock in the morning and I was a college student. So I was always up at 2 a.m. watching TV. Um, and that was how I fell in love with talking computers. All right, um, so it looks like people are just saying thank you and they can't wait to buy our book. So I think that's thank good. You. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so thank you so much everyone for attending. Thank you so much Liz for doing this book talk with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and like I said, um, people will be able to find the recording of this talk if you missed any of it or you just want to watch it again um, on our alumni website, which is alumni.mbill.edu slash recording. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. On, on the recording, will you be able to fix the sound? Because there were huge, huge gaps, in, uh, particularly when you were showing clips where there was no sound. 
Um, I did notice it was pretty low. I don't know. You might be able to turn it up. I do not have the ability to alter the recording at all, but maybe I can get the clips from Liz and we can figure something out. But none of the clips had any sound. I mean, I, you know, and I did check to see if, if and, and the sound was all the way up on the clips. And also my sound on my, uh, my laptop is all the way up. Huh. Hmm. So they're just sound when, when, like when Liz was speaking, where it just dropped out, I could see she was speaking, but there was no, no sound. And then okay. it would come back on. I'll take a look at the recording and see what we can do. That'd be great. Because there's a lot of interesting things. I was, I was a diehard Trekkie from the get go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. We'll work on Thank it. Thank you. Bye, Carol. Okay.